I've got the words up on the, on the screen there. It's, it's not so, something that we're going to have you guys sing along with right now, uh, but uh, we will be doing this song in the future. Uh, so if you just want to you know, follow along on the screen and read the words and just listen uh, so that you get an idea for when we do it uh, later uh, at a future date. So uh, this song is called God You Are. Dark, 
Cause that's just, just the kind of God you are. Well, we'd like to welcome all of you here this morning. Um, uh, I'd like to welcome those on, online as well. Um, we're going to get our uh, service started with the song of worship, but I ask that you'd uh, please stand as we sing, uh, O Come to the Altar.
cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you died for us so that we could come to your altar and worship you, God. That, uh, we are no longer separated from you, God, that uh, we can praise you and worship you, and that uh, we can have a relationship with you, God. I'd ask that you'd uh, be with us now as we uh, continue to worship and uh, hear from the pastor as uh, he dives into your word and brings your scriptures to us, God. I ask that uh, you just bless us and allow us to hear the words he has to say for us today, God, and ask all these things in your precious name. You may be seated. Uh, I'd ask that if you have any cell phones, that you'd uh, please uh, turn those to silent uh, so that uh, we're not disturbing the, uh, uh, the worship today. And uh, I'd ask that you'd uh, um, please turn with us as we uh, read uh, from Joshua this morning. Uh, Wayne will be reading our scripture. The scripture passage this morning is Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 through to 24. Let's listen to the Lord as he speaks to us this morning. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods, for it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we will also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves, that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. He said, then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord our God we will serve and his voice we will obey. And may the Spirit of God this morning impress that upon our hearts in its entirety. Oh, we'd like to ask that uh, we please stand again as we continue in worship. Yes and amen. Oh. 
all your promises are yes and amen. Beautiful Savior, you have brought me near. You pulled me from the ashes, you have broken every curse. Blessed Redeemer, you Jesus, 
broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in seated. Uh, just before I have Rhonda come up, uh, I keep forgetting to tell her that I need to make announcements. Um, so uh, this coming Saturday uh, at 2 o'clock uh, uh, from 2 to 4, we're going to be having a youth event. Now I know a lot of our youth aren't here, but I figured I'd make the announcement anyway. Um, so we're going to be meeting and uh, we're going to be going through some more of our study uh, about uh, what it means to live uh, in Christ. And uh, we're also going to be preparing for a future event. So uh, mark it on your calendar, uh, parents of youth. Uh, and I will be sending out an email to remind you all later. Thanks. Uh, and another special announcement. Rhonda has laid it out beautifully in our um, bulletin. So this is mainly for people who are watching online. Um, just a reminder that Friday, April 7th is Good Friday, and we will not be meeting here. We'll be meeting at Garside Bible Church down in the city with our other brothers and sisters from different AGC um, churches. There will be a lovely service and a lovely lunch to look forward to. And we have, we have good news. The good news, well, here, okay. The good news is you're not going to be asked to prepare anything. It's going to be a beautiful lunch. It's going to be all kinds of stuff, but you don't have to work at it. Because Meadow, uh, Connect, <laughs> Connect has been asked to supply veggie and fruit trays. So rather than asking you to bring an apple and you to bring some grapes and you to bring this, what we are asking you to do is bring some cash. And if you would make a donation toward the lunch, then our fellowship team will use that money to buy the fruit and vegetables that we need and to make up the trays for you. So, Monique, Monique is right over here. Monique will be at the back looking for your contribution. If you only bring uh, brought plastic, you've got two more weeks to bring some cash, okay? Thank you very much. Morning, church. Good morning. Are you happy you are here this morning? Amen. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, we should not be forgetting to be thankful to the Lord when we fight ourselves aloud and Lady to dance for the Lord. Sing, lift his name high above every other name. <laughs> Forgive Gibson sometime. He's only so excited for loving the Lord. Uh, I'm here to pray for the offering before we continue with the, the last Father. In the loving name of Jesus, we come before your presence. We want to thank you that you've been so good to us, so kind. You have provided unto us in various ways, O King of glory. And in return, we just want to offer something small, O God, just to say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yeah.
uh, announcement today and tonight we uh, shine the light will not take place uh, please those who will come do it next Sunday I believe yeah but tonight it will not be there ladies Bible study this Tuesday March 21 at 9.30 a.m. I, st I want to add more. I know, I know it is one of the, the meetings that is Lily. They has got a number. But we are, we, we, we are even less than what we need to be there at this Bible study. Please make an effort, ladies. That's the only time we can know what the, the might of God is when we lead the word of God. Yeah. We will know the might of God as you... And so I urge you, make an appoint of turning uh, to this Bible study. Prayer meeting will continue this Wednesday, March 22, 7 p.m. Uh, please, you are also welcome to pray. I know there is nothing hard to like prayers when it comes to Christianity. I know about it. I love to pray, no doubt about that. But I know you have to make a decision. You tell yourself, no cup of tea in the morning unless I pray, I say a prayer to the Lord for three minutes. And that's the only way you can, you can defeat this one who comes against you. That he is the devil. He will discourage you. And so you have to fight. You can even tell your stomach to stop. I remember there was a time I used to be 145 kgs. But I thank God for who I am today. Because I know I am strong. I feel stronger than when I was that weight. It's about calling the name of the Lord. Please come on Wednesday or join us. In Zoom, let's call on the Lord. He will be with us. He will listen to us. Membership crisis will start soon. Please, those who are interested in being members, officially members of the church, speak to our pastor who is with us here. And now I want to pray, or we pray together. Uh, for the congregation and, and whatever is there for us to pray. Father, in the loving name of Jesus Christ, we humbly come before your presence. And we want to thank you for your love, for your care, for your truth, O oh God. The Bible says that to my people in Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. How I pray, O oh God, that this morning, even as a church, Connect Community Church, Hamilton, that we may have that great desire even to seek your word, the knowledge that come from thee, O oh God of that we may not be destroyed because we don't know even who is our enemy and how he works to destroy us, oh God. I call on you, O oh Most High God, who have even given us a chance to be here this morning, not for anything else but even more not for nothing else than glorifying thee, O God, and listening to you through your servant, the pastor you have given unto us, O God. Holy Spirit of the living God, open our innermost, even to understand, even to know you, to love you, to rejoice, O God, 
in your presence always, O oh God. Thank you that your word has given us so many wonderful promises. Even have given us power and authority as people who believe in you and trust in thee. And yet, Lord, we are very much destroyed because of lack of knowledge or because of our traditions, O oh God, that we exalt more than the word of God. This morning, Father, there are even those who are suffering in their bodies. Some are in the hospitals, O oh God, families are in great desperate. But the Lord, your word says that by the stripes you received, we were healed. How I pray that this morning, O oh God, even as we gather here, that we can come to that understanding and claim as a believer, as the sons of God, that healing upon our body. Holy Spirit of the living God, help our innermost understanding that we can stand and proclaim of thy own goodness, of thy own love to us, O King of King and Lord of Lord. I pray that, O God, that this church may we all be unique for loving you, because of loving you, and because of understanding thee through your own word. For the Bible says clearly, if the spirit that loves Jesus Christ in Lomans, Lomans, dwells in us, that same spirit will quicken our mortal bodies, O oh God. Help us, Lord, even to come to that understanding and realization. That we can declare by your stripes again, as Peter has said, we are healed now. And claim it, O oh God, with no shame. Rejecting the whispers of the devil. That it is not done, but it is done and it is true. And if we claim it by faith, if we confess it in another word, understandable. If we confess it by faith, surely it is ours, O oh God. Meet them, those who are suffering, O oh God, especially in the hospitals. Some of them we know. Physically, some we don't know. But no one, is, oh, no one of us is hidden from your eyes, O oh God. We are all naked before your presence, O oh God. And you know our most deepest desire, O oh God. Thank you for the AGC readership. This morning we lifted them before you, O oh God that there may be a joy unto your heart, O oh God, even as they continue to lead this service to your glory and to your honor, Lord. We thank you, Lord God of heaven, that your word is true. It talks about persecution. And Lord, it's a wonderful thing even to hear and listen and know that there are persecutions taking place because of believing in you. 
Master, if there is any reason why we should uh, believe totally in your word, it is what is happening right now, the persecution. Some countries, oh God, people are killed. In our region, oh God, we are made to shut up and not speak and glorify God. Their persecution are coming in different ways. But your word is true, it will stand the test of time. And you have said that the word that have proceeded out of your mouth, you will not utter at, at all. How I pray this morning, the church of Christ, wherever it is in the whole world, can we stand and know that there is a God who delivered Shadlak, Meshach, Abednego out of the fire and even Daniel out of the lion's den. That we may stand bold. No matter what happened to us. I pray that you remove the spirit of fear of being ashamed. But it clear the word of God the way it is. Help us not to love our life so much that even sometime we better eat, we better sleep than reading the word of God. Equip your church starting with Connect Community Church. Start with your church, Lord. Start with this church that we can set the food apart and declare a lead a line of the word of God to know what is your mind toward us. We love you, Lord, and we exalt you. We lift our man, you, you who have given to us, I mean, to minister to us, Oh, how I pray that even as he does it, your Holy Spirit will guide his lips, his tongue, and his mind. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. And the church say, Amen. Amen. Welcome, Pastor. Good morning. Good morning. And once more, it is so good to be here together in the house of the Lord. Yes, to worship him, to praise him, to study his word. And that's what we're going to do now. Let us bow our heads as we prepare to study his word because this too is a form of worship almighty father we thank you for your word we thank you for the fact that you do not hide yourself from us that we do not have a mystery religion but that we have a religion where we can read and know who you are know what your nature is Know what your will is for us. Know our place before you. We know through your word what pleases you and what grieves you. So as we study your word now, as we continue on in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, we pray your blessing upon it to our hearts and to our minds so that we might be kingdom builders. Wonderful servants of the God who loves us so. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are going to read, continuing on in 5 of Matthew. 
starting at verse 17, and we're going to read from 17 to 32. And uh, this is... Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Truly, I say to you, until earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife... Let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. We have many laws and rules in society. Some which we might agree with, some which we might not. There is a law in Canada that says you shall not murder. I'm kind of in agreement with that. You're not to break and enter, and so on. Now, it's interesting that we have this law. You know, um, the uh, Canadian Medical Association used to also have a law. Well, it was a rule. Thou shalt not harm. You, You are there to heal people, not harm people. It's interesting that both that rule and the law against murder has kind of disappeared. Do you know how million, how many millions of people are killed by, by doctors? Some of them because they haven't been born yet and are considered um, inconvenient. Some of them because they feel like they want to leave this world. It's called medical aid in dying here in Canada, but it's just another name for euthanasia, the killing of people. And uh, as the laws progress, we will see that eventually there'll be a law 
that has nothing to do with whether you want to be want to have suicide or not, there's going to come a point where they're going to insist. Because that's how things have gone in other jurisdictions in this world. So yes, there are rules and there are laws, but there is something greater. And we've got to ask ourselves, what is the law for? What's the purpose of the law? If the law can change so that murder suddenly is allowed in certain circumstances, like, what is the law for? And it's very interesting, in Romans chapter 7, verse 7, um, Paul uh, writes um, to the Romans, and he says, What then shall we say, that the law is sin? Now he's talking about the Mosaic law the one given by God to Moses, to the people of Israel. Is the law sin? By no means, he says. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would have not known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had said, you shall not covet. And later on to the Galatians, He says something even more clear, I think. In Galatians chapter 3 and verses 24 to 25. And he says, so then the law was our guardian. In some um, uh, translation, it's a schoolmaster. It was our schoolmaster until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. We're not under a guardian anymore. The law of Moses was a schoolmaster teaching right from wrong. That was the purpose of the Mosaic law. And as we were talking momentarily ago, the law is under attack. You listen to some of the things, especially in the States, but here in Canada as well, about what judges are doing. And in the States, this whole thing about defunding police, which I'm sure there's a push here in Canada as well. But in the new covenant of grace, The question is, always been, are we under law? How does the law fit in to this question of grace? And how does grace fit in to the question of law? So Jesus begins with the question, or the the statement, that he does not come... He is not in the world today to, uh, he did not come into the world to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. And we have to wonder what is he saying? What exactly does he mean? That distinguishing between abolishing the law and fulfilling it. And, and in the Greek, abolish, abolish, uh, The the word abolish includes the meaning of destroying, throwing down, setting aside, stopping. That's not what Jesus came to do. He did not come to stop the law. He did not come to destroy the law. He did not come to throw down the law or set it aside. But he did come to fulfill it. Pleru in the Greek, to fulfill, to to make full, to complete the law. Now throughout this, this chapter, we're going to see Jesus saying basically a formula, you heard it said, but I say to you, So you've heard it said, you shall not murder. But I say to you, 
Everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Throughout this passage, we're going to see that. And the hurt it said is clearly talking about how and what the Pharisees and other rulers in his day was saying in regards to their interpretation of the laws of Moses. But Jesus is saying, I say to you, it's with authority, it's with the authority of the Lord. I say to you this. He came to give a fuller understanding of the law under grace, rather than the law of tradition that considers only external things. Jesus' law looks to the very internal of human existence, of human being. And I suggest to you, and I, I, I hope to show you, that when it comes to the law, the bar that was held for the Israelites under the law given at Mount Sinai is nowhere near as high as the bar set for us as members of the new covenant. We have a higher bar. We understand how much harder it is for a pole jumper, is that what they call them? I don't know, I was never in track. To, as the bar gets higher, how much harder it is to get over that bar. But we have a higher bar. So Jesus starts off with anger. And he ties anger in with murder. Now, of course, we know that in Exodus 20 and uh, verse 13, when the Ten Commandments are given, and we read that a couple of weeks ago, it says, as the sixth law, thou shalt not murder. And here, Jesus even adds, libel to judgment. Those who, will, those who murder will be liable to judgment, which is in the law of Moses, in Exodus, in Deuteronomy, but even goes as early as, um, as uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, where we read, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. That's capital punishment, brothers and sisters. A man who kills another man, murders another man, out of hatred, anger, whatever, is liable to be killed by his community. Because of the value of life placed on God's image. That's what we as humans are. People who are created in God's image. These are biblical truths. And the Pharisees took these, this law seriously, but they handled these laws responsively only. Jesus goes beyond that external into the internal. It's not enough simply to not murder. It begins in the heart. So even when you start with anger, because murder is generally an action responding to anger and to hatred. It starts there, he says. Your anger is already sin. Your hatred is already sin, whether you actually murder someone or not. Hating your brother is sin. You cannot come to God, Jesus says. Here he's talking in terms of the temple, offering your gift at the altar. 
You can't do that if you have hatred in your heart for a brother or a sister, but for anyone. You are a murderer and you're coming with your sacrifice as a murderer, he's saying. You can't do that. You have to go and be reconciled to your brother. This is why when we take communion, we take a moment to pray before God, giving an opportunity to at least repent of our, our, the things that are in our hearts so that we can receive the elements of the communion properly. This is how serious anger and hatred is. That even thinking hatefully is to break the law in God's eyes. And this is why reconciliation is such an important fact in Christian life. It is an expectation of the Lord. Now, I know that as a pastor, I am liable to piss people off. It happens. I'm dealing with a lot of people. And I'm not necessarily the, you know, we don't all communicate in the same way. And I might get you angry. It would never be my intention to do so. But if you are angry, then you come to me. And you say, Pastor, you said this, and it really upset me. So that I can say, I'm sorry I upset you. It was not my intention. Let's talk about this. And it's not just between me and you all. It's between every believer and every believer. It's between every believer and unbeliever. Now, we can't make unbelievers understand, but we can try to reconcile as far as it is in our power to live peaceably with everyone, Paul says. We do that. But we certainly as believers need to understand that being angry at each other is grieving God. It's sin. It has to go away. He continues on with lust. And he's dealing now, I would say, with uh, the Tenth Commandment. Thou shalt not covet. Because it, it may be that he's specifically looking at lust of a, a, a woman. But in the end, lusting after a woman is coveting a woman. It's covetousness. I need this. I want this. God says you should do otherwise. And again, we have this juxtaposition of the principle in regards to external acts, as the Pharisees would look at it, versus the internal activity that goes on. And one can't help but think, although Jesus doesn't here mention it, but I think of David and Bathsheba. When did David sin with Bathsheba? Well, notice what Jesus says. That everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. When did that happen? When David, who should have been out with the army but stayed at home, went on the balcony, looked across, saw Bathsheba bathing, and instead of turning right away, watched and coveted the adultery of David and Bathsheba on David's part at least happened then he committed adultery in his heart 
because adultery does, and any covetousness begins in the heart. Lust comes, covetousness comes when we permit ourselves to be tempted. And Jesus goes into quite hyperbolic statements about this. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Now, I don't believe that the first century church was a bunch of people with eye missing, eyes missing, and, and, and hands missing. These are hyperbolic statements to express just how serious the sin is. You cannot go around lusting after, coveting after, wanting things that are not yours, that should not be yours, because that already is sin in your heart. Thou shalt not commit adultery. This is in regards to divorce. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give him a certificate of divorce. But really, if you look on, he says, but I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. This is law number seven, commandment number seven in Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. And yes, the, the, you know, there is this truth, as the Pharisees put it forward, that, that um, divorce was permissible under the law of Moses. So we read in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 to 4, when a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some intent, uh, indecency in her, so there's sexual immorality, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hands and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house, and if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of the house, or if the latter man dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. In other words... If your spouse, now in the context of that century, that millennium, it's really, you know, the man was to protect the wife. That was his role. It's always been his role to protect his spouse, his wife, to watch over her, to care for her. But if she is adulterous, then the man can separate. Joseph, when he found out that Mary was pregnant, was thinking of just that in a very kind way. Not wanting to cause a ruckus, doing it quietly. And he would have been in his right to do it, according to the law. But the angel came, and he did not. So, again, we, we, we go back to this instance of... Now, I should say that in the tradition of the Pharisees, of, of the precursors of the modern-day Talmud, which is what the Jewish people really go by, you could divorce for your wife burning your toast... It got ridiculous. 
it got foolish. This was nothing to do with the law and everything to do with man's added tradition. God's principle is that only an act of sexual immorality, of adultery, and of course that always starts by lust, doesn't it? It starts by breaking that commandment. But that's the only reason that you have cause for divorce. And God intends that those who are adulterers should not marry. That is the commandment. You notice that Jesus doesn't put that aside. Because if you marry, you're causing adultery for someone else. Because in essence, your first wife is your wife. Until death do you part. That's not easy. But it is true according to the word of God. And I would suggest that Christ did not do away with the principles that are found in the law. That's what we're seeing here. Because God is unchanging. And his principles are unchanging. And the Old Testament laws, the laws given on Mount Sinai and that were written over the wilderness time by Moses, they were meant to be considered by their deepest intent. Not the way the Pharisees were doing it. By the external only. And of course, Jesus is pointing this out. He's illuminating this for us. Now, it's the Holy Spirit illuminating that truth for us. Because sin always begins internally and progresses to the external. I have to think I'm going to steal that before I steal it. I have to think I'm going to kill that guy before I kill that guy. Now, I mean, I'm not talking about accidental deaths. Even God had uh, in his law uh, cities of uh, refuge where you could go if you accidentally killed someone. The Best example is if you have an axe and the axe head goes off and hits someone and they die. That wasn't intentional. That was nothing that was coming from your heart. In fact, that's actually an even good example that things that, you know, you can, things that can happen but have no intent in your heart, that, you know, things that might happen like an accidental uh, death is not coming out of the internal. It just happened. It's the internal that's the problem. We always need to keep ourselves in check. After uh, the comment we read in in Romans chapter uh, 7 about the law not being um, the law not being sin He says, but sin seizing an opportunity, this is verse 8, but sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me all kinds of covetousness, for apart from the law, sin lies dead. It produced the covetousness. The truth of the matter is that I covet despite what I know I should do. And that is already Sin. And sin is serious. Even internal sin. This is what Jesus is saying here. 
My sin, internal sin, is as serious as external sin. It is sin. And we should do everything we can to keep ourselves from that, from that sin. Now that is almost impossible. Except for one thing. We have the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you have knelt down before him, if he is your Savior, if he is your Lord your commander in life, then you have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you and you are empowered and you will fail. Sometimes. It, it just will happen because we're still in this flesh. And that's why, thank goodness, there is freedom in Christ Jesus when we have put our faith in him. But that doesn't give us excuse, liberty, to sin. We need to deal with these things. So the truth of the matter is, as I said, the bar is higher for those under grace than under the law. God has a higher expectation for us than he ever had for the Israelites under the law. And we have that higher expectation, one, because we have Jesus' teaching. He's telling us these things. And we have freedom from slavery to sin by his death. And we have the power over sin by the indwelling Holy Spirit. It's these reasons, among others, that God has a higher expectation of those who are faithful Believers, born-again believers, true, genuine believers of Jesus Christ. The law in this world is under attack everywhere. God's law is under attack. But it is, or at least it ought to be, alive and well in the souls of those who have given their lives to Jesus Christ. So those that were blessed in the Beatitudes that we discussed over the last two Sundays, and thereby obeying those first few commandments, which were all about our relationship with God, love the Lord your God, have no other gods before you, do not use the, the name of the Lord in vain. Keep the Sabbath. Honor your mother and father. These are all relate more to our relationship with God, even relating to your mother and father as the image of God. That's what the Beatitudes dealt with. Now we're dealing more with, and we'll do some more next week, And we, we look now and we see that those who are blessed by the Beatitudes are the obeyers of the law of God's kingdom. Not only the obeyers, the purveyors. They bring the kingdom laws forward to the world. And the question, of course, for each and every one of us, including your pastor, is will we be faithful? Let us pray. Almighty Father, we thank you for the law that is intended to keep us not only safe, but to keep us well, to prosper us, and not to harm us. And we pray that you would help us to understand the depths of these laws, not only in their external action, but in their internal function. That we might not sin against you. 
But Lord, we also thank you because even in the midst of our, our fallen state, the, as we are saved in Christ Jesus, we are also forgiven. We praise you for your grace and mercy. And we pray you will help us to be worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to uh, close with a song of worship. I uh, ask that you uh, please stand with us as we sing to the King of Kings. strengthens us, who gathers us up into his arms, who watches over us day by day. May he empower you, strengthen you, encourage you, and may you go forth 
in his power and in his might and to his glory. Go out into the world and give them heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.